here to tell you about Faircom, so thank you for taking the time to come and listen, and thank you, Kima, for inviting us. Um, um, I'm uh, a strategy advisor for Faircom, and I got involved in Faircom about a year ago. Uh, Bas, who is the CEO of Faircom, is an old colleague of mine. Uh, we used to work together at Back Society, which is an institute for arts, technology, and science in Amsterdam. And this is also the place where the idea for Fairphone started about three years ago. Um, and the introduction of, on Clean Web said um, Fairphone started as an awareness project for um, uh, conflict minerals in Congo, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and is now turned into a phone. So, and it's true, it's, it went from that to a phone in three years. So why a phone? So <laughs> we all have a phone, I assume, it's generally a smartphone, except Bob, our CEO, doesn't have a phone. <laughs> <laughs> has nothing to do with fair phone, but he just doesn't, and he has his own reasons, and I don't know what they are, he thinks it's intrusive. But anyway, he started this. <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah, so we all have a phone, we all love it, we keep, keep it close to, to us, we keep it in arm's reach, and we even have it next to our beds. Um, you could say it's almost like the ideal partner. He's good looking, he's uh, exciting, he's smart, he's creative, he's very cool, he knows all the right people, and um, you know uh, when you take him with you, people will be impressed. Uh, he's the kind of guy you're willing to wait for because you know when he turns up, it'll be worth it. <laughs> But then you go, it takes a couple of dates to get to know somebody, and then you find out that he actually talks a lot about money, and he doesn't care at all about the environment. <laughs> and he appears to have no morality, because he treats his employees pretty bad sometimes, except the happy few. Um, so it's quite disappointing. So you now, in, you really, really like this guy, but he actually doesn't share the same values. So and that's what we had at Fairphone. So we started digging a little bit deeper. Um, so this is cobalt. This is one of the elements that goes into your phone, into your batteries. Um, and it's mined by these guys. And uh, this is a mine about 60 meters deep. It's dug by these guys, who um, are the miners in Congo. And they're actually quite lucky to be alive because um, there's an unofficial war in the Congo. and um, uh, it has claimed about 5 million lives in the last 15 years.
the last 15 years, more than 4 million people have died. These minerals end up in mobile phones. Like my Nokia. Does that make me responsible? We are all responsible. And you know that all this is going into you. You must feel revolted by this situation. We are human beings. to Blood in the Mobile that some of you might have heard of, heard of or seen. Um, it's a, yeah, pretty intense. It's a documentary, but it works with also a little bit of drama added to it. Um, and once the stuff has been mined, it goes into the batteries and it goes to factories in Asia, for example, where women are working very long hours to stick about 800 stickers on your battery per hour in questionable working conditions and for a wage that, wage that might not support the family. Um, if you are European, like I think most of us are here, uh, we're in the luxurious position of, of consuming all this and enjoying everything that it brings. Um, uh, but at the same time, we're also uh, uh, disposing about 15 kilos of electronic waste that might end up in Ghana, for example, where little children uh, burn the cables, uh, inhaling all the toxins for a slight bit of copper um, earning sometimes just one pound a day or nothing at all. So um, we were asking ourselves, is this the kind of uh, 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 work and the kind of the way of working that we want to endorse by buying a mobile phone? Or is this the kind of supply chain, is this the only kind of supply chain that can produce uh, a really nice mobile phone? Or is it possible to um, make a phone that also takes into account people and the environment um, without making it ridiculously expensive, because that's also something to consider. So the more we find out about uh, the supply chain, the more we realize that, um, yeah, we might have to make this phone ourselves because there is no alternative in the mobile phone market. So what we can do is we can raise awareness, we can talk about all the things that are not going well, but where do you go? So it's, it's a little bit like watching the news and you see all these horrible things that are happening and then you turn off the television and you feel bad, but there's nothing you can do. So um, yeah, by making this mobile phone, we're actually giving people a platform to act. Um, so the phone becomes a means to an end. So by taking the phone as a starting point, um, we're trying to open up um, all these closed and inaccessible systems and it forces us to truly understand um, the nature of the issues that are going on and gives us the opportunity to take action. Um, so the phone becomes like a, almost a storytelling artifact. It's, um, it's, it's not about the latest features anymore but it's about the story of everybody involved in making it. Um, and it's, it's, it's also a little bit of a political object um, to show that, um, yeah, by buying it, you, you t say we want um, a different economic system that not only takes into account money, but also value and, and meaning and, and sharing, um, and, and not uh, just pull hard cash. So we went to the, Dem well, my colleagues went to the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they found a mine, and they are setting up a uh, fair uh, mineral trade route. Um, they went to China and selected a um, production partner who was aligned with our mission. And they came here to London to Google Campus, um, invited by professional green ventures, and set up a social enterprise. And created um, a roadmap to um, create the first fair phone. So this is, uh, this is quite a long story, but uh, we use so our aim is to make one single high high performance smartphone that's made as fairly as possible and with a, a transparent supply chain. So we use the precious materials. Every material is precious, uh, conflict free resources, and that put people first. So we're not fueling war, but we're um, making the communities flourish. 
uh, lasting value, so addressing the full lifespan of the phone, uh, giving people clear deals, not only the people who buy the phone, but also our suppliers, and also all the people that work on the phone. Um, we're aiming to build uh, long-term relationships with our suppliers so we can ensure uh, their good working conditions, we can ensure um, that it's safe there, uh, environmental protection, and um, we also set up uh, workers' funds so they can, the people are empowered to talk to their uh, employees and go to, into discussion with them. Um, and smart design. Design, I think at the Fairphone, most people have a background in design. This is because we come from our society. And um, one of our main uh, design principles is if you can't open it, you don't own it. And I think uh, my, the previous speakers uh, agree with this because if you can't open it, you can't do much about it. Uh, if it's broken, you can't fix it. If the battery is dead, um, your phone's. Uh, at the end of his life, sorry. Um, so we want to design a phone that uh, lasts. So you get complete control over how you use it. You can configure it, it's open source, you can open it, you can replace the batteries, um, and you can fix it if, if you're capable of doing that, or you can bring it to one of these projects and get some help. Um, so, this is all well and good, and then eight weeks ago we started the launch campaign, and uh, we did it. We started selling phones. Uh, the idea was that we needed to have 5,000 phones so we could start production, and right now, this afternoon, we're at 9,633 phones. And it really shows that uh, the, the overwhelming response, and also in the community, I think we have 20,000 active community members who help their phone, uh, they advise them, uh, partnerships. Uh, we just had a design boot camp where people from all over the world came to that society to help think about how you can design a phone that, that lasts, what you can do to, to make that happen. Um, so, uh, yeah, that means that almost 10,000 people have put 325 euros down for something they've never felt, they've never seen, doesn't exist yet. And that gives us the, um, yeah, we see that the people are committed to this kind of change, that this means, you know, this is, that there's a real market for this. So it's very exciting times and a proof of concept for us. Um, but it's just the beginning, so this phone's not 100% not fair yet, and 100% fair doesn't exist. Um, it's a journey, as we say it, uh, to recovering a relationship with your phone. Recovering a relationship that got lost in like a big global economic system. And I was looking in the kitchen yesterday and I saw a pile of drawings of my daughter who was two and a half. And I keep putting them on the fridge and then there's another one and it looks exactly the same. But I put that on the fridge and I put the other one on the pile, but I don't throw them away, but they all look the same and actually not that, you know, they're nice, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you don't throw them away because you feel related to what she made and it has value to you, but then again, then I've got this phone, which I carry around with me, it's mine, and it represents, you know, half of my life, and I'll just throw it away and get a new one, I, I feel, uh, you know, it doesn't mean anything to me. And I think that's one of the design challenges that we're looking at right now. It's like, what can we do to make this my phone again, to make it valuable to me, to make me want to fix it when it's broken? Because it's my phone, it's my fair phone, and I want to keep it.